later, you might be getting mass emails from me at some point in the first couple of emails. Sorry, okay? Not email. Meeting. I can use words in my Um. Anyway, y'all know what you're here for. So. Sorry. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, you're fine. Awesome. All right, so thanks a lot. And uh, let's see, where do we start here? So before I get to the lighting issue, first thing I want to do is <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> because I need to prove that this is a thing that happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's, that's why I said that. All right. Everybody smile. Three, two, one. All right. Thank you. That's going on. Is that kind of like my laptop? <laughs> <laughs> my processor and my laptop. My name is Jared Miracle. Uh, I guess I'm Dr. Miracle now, which is an interesting name. Uh, I'm Jared Miracle. I'm the Director of Research and Development at Microsoft. Uh, I was going to say, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I am the Director of Research and Development. <laughs> uh, just, just, he was also a superhero in the 60s. You know. uh, mm -hmm. So a couple of questions, because I don't normally lecture in this room. Can everybody in the back hear me? Outstanding. Okay. Uh, number two, just a quick question. Raise your hand if you're here to get extra credit. Yeah. That's actually a smaller percentage than I was planning. Intriguing. How many of you heard about this via Facebook? Okay, interesting. How many of you are members of a Facebook group called Burbank? Intriguing. Mm. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Thanks for coming in. We're also being webcast, just FYI. Uh, okay, so if we could get just the front lights turned off, somebody is. Hey, score. Alright, we're so good. I totally stole that background from. Uh, the official Pokemon people. <laughs> and then I photoshopped it because I'm doing like that. Uh, Alright, so I'm sure you're very curious what I'm actually going to be talking about here. So let me start off with just a brief introduction. Uh, I was going to be interacting for like the next 40 minutes. I'm an anthropologist and a book tourist, which in this department means, you know, it's like one in the same book. We tend to uh, Across At some schools, folklore has its own department. Uh, either way, so I study people, and because I'm a folklorist, I'm interested in what we call vernacular culture. So the, uh, the, the culture of people who are not like writing the books and making the movies and all that. But I'm interested in the people who read the books and who watch the movies and who play the video games or the card games or you know, watch the TV show. Uh, that's what I mean when I say that I'm a folklorist. I want to know what you guys are thinking and how communities work and that sort of thing. When I say folklore, probably the first thing that comes to mind is like fairy tales and stuff. Which, yeah, we do a pretty fair amount of, of research into where they come from and what they mean. Uh, but there's a lot of other business that goes on there. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you as an academic, because this is a quasi-scholarly discussion, believe it or not. As I said on the fly, college doesn't have to be boring, guys. Like, it could be cool. I promise. Um, so I'm still, I'm supposed to identify for you my areas of specialization, even though I'm kind of a polymath. Uh, I'm using the media except for things from that. Anyway, so things that I tend to focus on in my writing and research, uh, violence is my central theme. I look at narrative, the supernatural, and religion. Uh, transnational cultures, so how stuff gets from Japan to America, that kind of thing. East Asia, the concept of play, why we play, which I'm going to get into later because it's really important. Uh, and what are called food ways, or how people interact with the things that they make and eat, uh, which I'm not really going to get into today, but it, it, it's a lot of fun. We can talk food sometime if you want. I also make a wicked good avocado kimchi pizza. <laughs> Oh, it's delicious. Uh, so, what's my Pokemon cred? Because I'm sure some of you are wondering. Because people tend to, and as a folklorist, I'm sensitive to this. People tend to be upset when some academic guy 
uh, comes on CNN and clearly has no idea what he's talking about, but they still want him to comment on something like Pokemon. And we saw this back in the 90s and early 2000s where someone would come on you know, Fox News or whatever and be all, the Pokemans are dangerous because, you know, animals can fight and stuff. So, and, and clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. That drives me crazy, uh, both as a folklorist and as a Pokemon player. Like, how can you not, you know, take this stuff at least with, with a little, like a modicum of seriousness? So what's my cred? I'm an old school player. Uh, I, I picked up the games when they first came out. When I was in middle school, and a lot of you were like in diapers. <laughs> Good lord, this makes me feel old, but I feel it's necessary. I actually played in before there was such a thing as like the competitive Pokemon League that they have now. Uh, I played in something called the Summer Training Tour '99. I was a finalist in Indianapolis, which, as you know, if you played it all competitively, is kind of a rough crowd. Always has been, probably always will be. Uh, but I'm totally out of touch and like. I am in awe of Phil Barta here, who came in eighth at regionals not too long ago. Uh, yeah, so like I can't compete. Instead, I'm doing the, the Professor Oak thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, how old am I? I'm old enough that that's the Pikachu I grew up with. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he used to be chunky. They like put him on a weight loss regimen. <laughs> what are my goals here for the next like half hour or so? Uh, threefold. One, I want to give you a brief cultural history of where Pokemon comes from. I, I tend to say inflammatory things to get attention, right? <laughs> like, that's the problem with, with people like me, is we enjoy standing in front of a group of people and like lecturing and stuff, which I'm sure is frustrating for a lot of folks. Uh, one of the inflammatory things that I said to get people here today is that Pokemon is 2,000 years old and I can prove it. And I'm totally going to prove it in a minute. Uh, so I'm going to tell you how it came into being and you know became the, the sort of cultural phenomenon that it is now. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of interpretation regarding what people are actually doing with the Pokemon now. Uh, because the, the concept of the game, the franchise, etc., uh, it's changed over time. And it serves a social role. And it's actually kind of important. Uh, it's a thing people should care about, and do care about. Because uh, I learned on the internet recently, lots of flaming. Um, and, and to explain to you just in general why play like Pokemon is really important. So, when I first set out to do this project, which I'm totally in the middle of right now, by the way, so we're going to get to the end and it kind of peters off, because uh, I don't want to throw all my cards on the table at once. Um, I, I, I set about reading all of the relevant literature, of which there is one book. Uh, there is one scholarly treatment that came out in 2004, it's called Pikachu's Global Adventure. And the, uh, the subtitle here, that you can't quite see, is The Rise and Fall of Pokemon. Think about that for a second, it's 2004. How many of you were, like, playing Pokemon when you were kids, right? In 2004, um, I have a major problem with this book. While there is a lot of good scholarship, when you actually like sit down and read it and, and find out what these guys have to say, it turned out to be what we call armchair anthropology. Uh, the, the people who contributed to it, by and large, sat down and said, well, this is a fad. Let's, uh, let's just analyze how this fad came and went. And, you know, it's now 2014, almost 2015, and so it's 2004, uh, Ruby and Sapphire had just been released to video games. Whoop! Whoop and Think about that for a second. It's now 10 years later, right, to the year, and what just got re-released, if you keep up with this? <laughs> Omega, Ruby, and Alpha Sapphire. Yeah, so clearly the decline of Pokemon and Uh all right, so ultimately the scholarship is kind of lacking, and I'm trying to rectify that. Uh, and this is turning into a long-term project. Started as a paper, quickly became a book, and now I'm you know, shopping around for publishers, and we're talking about how to fund a documentary, because uh, I want to follow competitive players. And there's a whole lot going on with it, actually. 
And I'm so incredibly pleased to see all this public interest, because uh, it's important. Um, specific problems I have with the book that I'm trying to address, uh, they assume things. They assume that it's for children. They assume that only children are playing. There's one whole chapter where it's like, yeah, there's some adults, but it's really a kid's thing. No, it's definitely not. Like, show up to any Pokemon League on a Saturday morning, and it's like 90% adult. Um, so there's way too much emphasis on this as a kid's thing. Um, it's also got this like weird Marxist deal going on, by which I mean like every single essay in this book looks at making money as a bad thing. Which, if you think about it, is pretty weird. Like, everybody in this room would like to get a paycheck at some point in the future, and we'd like to think we can do it by, you know, contributing to society, being helpful, doing good work. There is no reason why you can't do that and make a paycheck. So what's wrong with the Pokemon people doing that? Um, so how am I going to solve this issue? Well, first I'm going to do what's called participant observation, uh, ethnographic field work if you're into anthropology or sociology. Basically, I've been hanging out with Phil and the rest of the Pokemon League group, traveling around Texas when I can afford to, because no one wants to fund this yet. And, and hanging out with these competitive players to find out exactly what this stuff means in their lives. Um, and at the same time, I do a lot of historical research, uh, finding out about you know, what's the cultural background of this stuff. So amusingly, uh, Joseph Tobin was the editor of that book. And in the, uh, in the introduction, he lays out all of the things that are wrong with the type of stuff that, that he wants to do and then proceeds to let a bunch of people do it in the book. Uh, so he said, I, I'm sorry I'm reading off the slide here. Much of the scholarship in this field is done by scholars who are guided by the a priori, beforehand theoretical stances and by empirical data. Too much of the writing on children and popular culture by neo-Marxists and professors sitting in their offices, exorciating and praising children's toys and texts without directly studying children, doing careful industrial analysis and uh, systematically invest in the historical, cultural, and socioeconomic context of the product of production. Basically, he's complaining that people write about stuff without actually doing it, and then he wrote about stuff without actually doing it. The guy didn't play Pokemon. He didn't seem to know much about it, actually. Uh, so as a native of Pokemon, I feel the need to, uh, to correct this. I was born in Palatine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what's the history? I'm going to give you the 2,000 years thing because that seems to be what most of us are interested in. We're going to go to China, all right? Now, before most of recorded history, we're talking 3,500 uh, BC, okay? We know that Chinese people were carrying around crickets as companion animals. <coughs> the same way that people have dogs or cats nowadays, in China at that time, People were carrying around small cages with crickets, um, and some other bugs, but mostly crickets. And the reason they did that was because they create music, right? Uh, if you've ever heard the different varieties of, of crickets that live in central China, especially uh, parts of southeast China, they, they have the most interesting, beautiful, intricate songs that they make. And so this intrigued people, and they would carry them around because, hey, cricket can't help it, you can it up. <coughs> Why you don't have like you know raging bulls and companion animals, except for toilets. Um, <laughs> sorry, my brain is totally in Pokemon mode now. Like, you should go. Okay, so that goes on for thousands of years. You know, it's just a common thing. Same way people keep dogs. Uh, but then in the Song Dynasty, around 960 to 1278 uh, CE, right? So after after AD comes about. Um, the aggressive male crickets at some point in here, people started to realize that they fight for territory. Um, and they have these big mandibles that they use for basically wrestling. And if you agitate them and put them in a small container <coughs> together, they'll wrestle. And they'll wrestle until one of them gets flipped or tossed or scared or whatever. Um, and I actually got to interview some elderly Chinese men who did this back in the 40s, like as a when they were kids, they would, they would forget fight. Um, and, and 
this quickly led, of course, to gambling because, you know, people gambling. <laughs> um, so here's a photo you can actually see. It's in Shanghai, I believe, uh, of a bunch of, these are mostly grown men, and they're cricket fighting in that white arena there. Uh, and, I mean, massive sums of money, thousands and thousands of dollars go into this. And then during the Cultural Revolution in China, it was made illegal, and there's a whole thing there I'm not going to go into. But it, it's gone through rises and declines over time. But you can see, even here, the depiction of children and their cricket fighting. Right? And that's, uh, you know, later during the, during the Manchu period. Uh, but the point is, people are keeping these companion cricket animals, bonding with them, and then having them fight each other. And later on, the fighting spread to other critters. Uh, if you go to Shandong province, you'll see quail fighting. Guys carry around these tiny little birds, and they, they have them fight each other. Uh, praying mantis, you know, if you've ever seen like a Bruce Lee movie, head to the dragon, they have praying mantis fights. Um, and you're all familiar with beta fish, or Siamese fighting fish, right? They get all puffed up and angry, and turn into Gyarados after a while. Um, so the you know, this is a thing that happens. I've even seen goat fighting in Central China. True story. They raise goats to fight each other. And they bet on it. Um, yeah. And, and this happens with crickets. But the crickets are unique for a couple of reasons. Uh, the primary one being, I couldn't find any other instances in which the, the people, at least in the Chinese case, were bonding with the animals the way they did with the crickets. In fact, the word that they use for it in Mandarin is cricket friend. Uh, they become very close with these animals. Uh, so it has to do with issues of companionship. Uh, and, and I also, my hypothesis on why crickets and not other animals, they're constantly safe. Even when one loses a wrestling match, uh, we end up finding out that, hey, it's okay. The worst thing that ever happens is it loses an antenna or a leg or something. To a cricket, not that big a deal. Um, you know, got to be a little awkward, but hey, it is what it is. Um, but if you do this with birds, with mammals, there's blood and mess, and, and we identify that way, you know, with the animals fighting, dog fighting, for instance, is seen as distasteful now. Um, and so I believe that the, the reason cricket fighting continued to be popular over time was that it's reasonably safe for everyone involved. Um, there's very little like visible damage. So, in order to understand where we're going with this, you need to know that Japanese culture, even now, is heavily, heavily informed by Tang period Chinese culture. The Tang period was like 618 to 907-ish. Um, and during that period, it, it was this big, uh, sort of boom in Chinese culture, a lot of poetry, a lot of art is happening, and that spreads over the inland sea to Japan. And the Japanese, especially the aristocracy, started sort of accommodating, appropriating all of these practices. Um, so here's an example of something that's going to look familiar. Uh, this is a gourd. The gourd has been hollowed out, polished, and shaped, and then had a lacquer put on the outside. Uh, with some very ornate depictions of children uh, cricket fighting. And can you guess what the gourd is used for? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's like a little carrying case, a storage thing. Um, so they're carrying around these fighting crickets in a storage container, which, by the way, has been shaped to maximize the acoustics. So you can hear it. It's like a little speaker. <laughs> Carried around. In parts of China, even now, uh, when you hear someone cell phone go off, the ringtone is pretty sure. That's not all that unusual. Uh, and here's a different type of carrying base. So, okay, you can probably see where I'm going with that. We'll get to it in a minute. So bear that in mind. Uh, so now we're in Japan, right? So the Tang Dynasty is heavily influencing the Japanese. And when something like that happens, basically lower classes in society tend to imitate upper classes. When rich people do stuff, when, when famous people start doing things or wearing a particular type of clothing, um, something like that, lower classes below them tend to imitate whatever they're doing. So when Kim Kardashian is seen wearing a particular brand of clothing, suddenly their stock prices go up. The 
because people, even, even subconsciously, will imitate upper classes. That's a common thing. Um, so this is happening in Japan, where the climate tends to be a little different. It's much more mountainous, and to be colder overall. So you have different species of insects. And rather than the, the Chinese song crickets, uh, people started carrying around sort of a cicada, uh, called a Suzumushi, sorry, I'm trying to figure out where this guy went. So here's one of the songs that we can get the sound going. Do I know that sound? Hang on. Whoa, what's that? I don't know. That's not cool. It's on the computer. Okay, so this is Sukumushi, a uh, Japanese sort of cicada. Alright, that's probably it. Um, so you can get a sense of, of how different insects can sound around the world. And they become the sort of uh, predominant, you know, musical... They're basically like a, like a little ancient iPod. And you're carrying them around, you know, listen to them, and Kind of like that jerk on campus who like has the speakers and blaring out the back there. Somebody catch that guy, by the way. <laughs> Bring him in the middle of a meeting the other day and just standing outside all, you know. But people wouldn't be for good sake. All right. So, uh, Suzumushi becomes really popular. And, of course, other practices are going to be copied, too. Um, well, the Japanese have perhaps more than anyone in the world a, a profound love of all things insect, and in particular beetles. Uh, if you ever, I'm dating myself here. When I was a kid, big bad beetle forms was popular, kind of a kind of a uh, Power Rangers ripoff. Um, but they're they're styled after different types of beetle, right? Rhinoceros beetle, or a beetle. Um, Japanese folks, by and large, if we're going to make a general statement. They really dig beetles. Uh, and can you blame them? I mean, how cool is that book? Um, and so, culturally, they tend to represent strength, independence, uh, things like that. In fact, they're even called Kabuto Moshi, the samurai warrior helmet bug. Kabuto is the type of helmet <coughs> that, that they wore. Um, all right, and, and it also has to do with issues of childhood nostalgia. Um, so, over time, uh, the Japanese educational system values more and more, even now, it, it continues to intensify a love of nature. So they try to sort of put that into children from a very young age. And so after World War II, when they're, you know, we're looking at a lot of industrialization, cities are getting bigger, everything's getting paid, uh, it became that much more important as wilderness disappeared, the children be able to go out into the field and experience wilderness. And part of the way that they have done that historically and continue to do it today, um, and I, I mean, I've taken kids out into the fields myself and done this in Japan, uh, is to have a summertime bug catching project. Schools will assign kids to go out and catch you know, different species of insects and then document them, observe them, uh, and, and learn about them. And so, in the summer, you'll often see kids running around with nets and big, you know, floppy hats, trying to catch these friggin' gigantic uh, rhinoceros beetles. Uh, one actually flew into my face once while I was riding my bike over a bridge. It was nasty. Really. It's all like, ah, I'm totally attacking you. But that's good for you. Even though I love these, these things, that's a little much. That ended up in the grill. So, uh, one of the activities that ends up coming out of this, though, is the little boys, you know, they're catching bugs, they're catching these beetles. The male rhinoceros beetle has a very strong territorial instinct. Same thing with the, with the Chinese fighting creatures, right? So this territorial instinct comes out, if you agitate them a little, put them on a log together, they're gonna wrestle until one gets torn off. It's inevitable. Um, and so, Naturally, little boys catching bugs. What else are you going to do with them, right? Start putting them on a log. It's called konchu zumo. 
or Kabutomo Shizumo, literally insect sumo. Love it. <laughs> Nothing in the world better than putting together insects and freaking sumo wrestling. My life is awesome. Um, and, and so these guys, you know, they, they, they become sort of covenant. They're, they're, they're companion animals, but they're also, you know, these wrestlers that you're training. Uh, now, as I mentioned, post-war Japan is urbanizing. A whole lot of pavement going on. And the more you're paving stuff, the less you're going to see these beautiful insects. Uh, sort of famously right now, there's a problem in Japan where fireflies are disappearing dramatically. What were once a very common thing to see in the late summer, uh, now you, you very rarely see that many fireflies, in, even in rural Japan. It's an issue because they pave the sides of, of river. Um, and so, invariably, it becomes that much more valuable. The schools are taking kids out into the field more often. And one of the people who absolutely loved collecting insects was this guy uh, back in the 70s and 80s, his name was Satoshi Tajiri. Okay. Now, Mr. Tajiri was a nerd. I mean a colossal freaking nerd, uh, this guy. And, and he loved insect collecting, he loved computers and playing games, um, and he's kind of a shut-in, you know. He's the kind of guy you expect to play video games and, and collect books. Uh, but he saw this happening, this urbanization, he realized one day in the late 80s, there were people growing up their entire lives in Tokyo and never going out into the woods. They never experienced firsthand walking through a field and having a huge freaking bug land on your face. You're like, uh -huh. Sorry, I just saw a flashback to that field. Just like, aha! I guess he thought my face was another male beetle. Which, okay, I can see that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so he realized this was a problem. He felt bad for kids growing up in a city who never got to experience this. And it occurred to him one day uh, that one of, the, one of the ways he could solve this problem and sort of rectify it for the unfortunates who don't get to experience that love of nature would be to bring it to them through technology, which is sort of his thing. And in particular, he was inspired by this invention, which, okay, I'm dating myself again. When I was a kid, this was brand new and awesome, uh, called the Link Cable. So Nintendo had released a portable video game system called the Game Boy, which you're all familiar with. Uh, and in order to play uh, against each other, you know, usually on Tetris, because Tetris was new, uh, we're talking 1989. They have this cable you can plug into two systems and play against each other. And he realized you could use this in a variety of ways, and one of those ways would be to cooperate rather than to play competitively. You could transfer data back and forth. And basically, thus Pokemon was born. Uh, he once told the New York Times, and has not since been willing to repeat it in other interviews, that he actually had a dream one night where he saw a beetle climbing across the cable between two Game Boys. Um, and I, I think that's apocryphal, but it's still kind of a beautiful image. This guy wanted to share nature so much that he created this thing we all care about. Now, when you create something so popular like Pokemon, uh, you end up with what we call a cultural bricolage, or sort of a sort of a, a coalescing of different cultural factors that people will grab and utilize in whatever way suits their social needs. And that's exactly what happened with Pokemon. So, things I'd like to point out, here's some examples of how over this 2,000 year period, things have kind of coalesced and, and come full circle. So if we look to the far left here, we have various shapes and sizes of those uh, fighting cricket boards. Um, mostly from Qing period China. And then, okay, so those inspired uh, the guy who created Dragon Ball, uh, Toriyama Akira, to create the, the capsules. If you've ever watched Dragon Ball or read the comic, um, there are these little things that can carry around massive <coughs> objects inside of them. And he was inspired very, very easily. 
linearly by the existence of those gourds who carry stuff. And then, of course, that inspired the Pokeball. Basically, my argument is that those gourds were medieval Pokeballs. <laughs> this particularly amuses me because inside the narrative of the games, you're using uh, Apricorns, which is almost a gourd, to carry around Pokemon in the ancient times in the story. There are levels of meta narrative going on, which is a folklore that's just, oh man, I'm about to lose it. <laughs> There's so much going on here. Also, when I get this book out. Okay. Uh, another example this is a painting of children cricket fighting under a tree. This is Japan, where you have a community organization for beetle fighting. It's a little arena. Kids are hanging out. You can see the bug catcher girl in the background, right? This this is a thing. I mean, this is still hugely popular in rural Japan. Uh, uh, there are there is usually like a shack, and if you go to any rural Japanese town and you drive around long enough, you will find like a little one room shack with a mural painted on the side of a big old friggin' beetle, and it will have some kind of a phrase on there about this is the place for beetle fighting. Uh, it's now a multi-million dollar industry. People buy and sell exotic beetles for fighting and breeding and raising. Uh, Japanese folks love beetles. Can you blame them? And then here are American kids at a mall playing Pokemon. And you can see how the more things change, the more they really just stay the same. Some other examples. <laughs> Captain of my team is Heracross. Although quickly becoming Hanayama because Hanayama. <laughs> um, but okay, so Heracross, they didn't even have to do anything. It's just like, hey, turn that into a Pokemon. All right, uh, let's give them giant scary eyeballs and kind of weird print. <laughs> okay, and then the bug catcher I love because this is Satoshi Tajini in game. The guy who invented Pokemon put himself in there as a character archetype that continues today. This is Japan, where kids are catching bugs, and it's sort of a cultural trope. You'll see that image of the boy with the floppy hat and the, uh, and the net. You'll see that all over uh, in Japan when, when people are sort of poking fun at the bug collecting Um And just to further <laughs> illustrate how big this activity is, here is a uh, Japanese children leave their plastic toys and a funny cabinet and a They find in a beetle festival. People engage in wrestling and tug of war events, much to the delight of the bodies. In Japan, summer is the season for insects, and one of the most favorite, especially among children, is the big brown rhino beetle. Many children brought their pet beetles to enter the numerously matches, <laughs> known as Sydney Kawasaki, located about 80 miles northwest of Tokyo on Sunday. They can measure more than two inches in size, and the male beetle sports a sharp protruding horn, which looks like that of a rhino. The beetles struggle to push each other off a tree stump. Hello there. Hello there. They look very cool when they fight with their horns. <laughs> Apart from wrestling, some beetles took part in tug of war events. <laughs> One beetle was standing in the air with its horns still tied to the string after a Boston battle. It looked painful. <laughs> Rhino beetles, as well as the smaller stag beetle, are popular insect pets for many Japanese elementary school students. Boys, especially, keep them in plastic cages. Some are found in the wild, but they are also sold at pet stores across Japan, with the price tag ranging from $6 up to $350. Wow. Okay, so that's, I mean, this is, this is not an old-fashioned activity necessarily. This is still going on. But the question invariably is, why has this taken off in the U.S. arguably more than in any other place on Earth? Um, in fact, I, I think if we break down the statistics, it's more popular here, uh, Pokemon, that is, than it is in Japan. Uh, so why on earth would that be? We actually have, as if we're talking mainstream, like Western European influence culture in North America, we have a very long and proud history of this. 
Uh, does anybody actually recognize what's happening right now? Go for it. Cockfighting. Cockfighting. <laughs> Cockfighting has historically been a big deal in Western culture. Um, now, yes, these days it's seen as somewhat distasteful uh, and, and violent and perhaps harmful to the, to the birds, although even Mark Twain in Life on the Mississippi attended a cockfight and said that while he himself didn't like it, it seemed like the cocks themselves were having a good time. And that does actually seem to be the case. The birds kind of enjoy fighting, uh, because that's what they're born and bred to do. I mean, it's, it's in their blood. It's like letting a golden retriever run after a tennis ball. You know, like, you can't not run after the tennis ball. Uh, so this is a photograph from 1890. Uh, I've also just wanted to include it because I found it in the National Archives in DC this summer, and I'm like, I've got to show this to people, and nobody's ever seen it before. Uh, and I love it. They're, they even have rounds, right? The guys up there climbing it with pocket watch. But I especially love the little boy, right? Little boy, and, it's, and I'm guessing that's his brother, someone you probably know. Um, and they, they're learning how this works. Like, this is a part of their culture. And it's a very important and proud part of American culture that goes back to the very beginning and all the way back to the Middle East and the spread of human civilization out of the Middle East. And the question is, why? Why do we as human beings have this innate need? Whether you personally don't like it or, or are an active cockfighting participant, uh, regardless, we as a species have sort of an inborn need to have this, what I call, proxy fighting take place. Whether it's roosters, or bugs, or rams, or watching Manny Pacquiao win like a ninth different title uh, because that guy is a robot. Um, <laughs> or robots. I saw Big Hero 6 this week, and holy crap, that was an awesome movie. Um, but, but, okay, even robots, right? We have this innate to watch other things fight, specifically when we train with them uh, and build them up. And even to the extent of abstracting it to a card game, uh, we still have sort of a, a narrative going on, or at least a meta-narrative, about how the play and the fight are the same thing, and we want to watch it and somehow influence it without necessarily engaging, right? Because uh, you don't have the fantasy of, like, Pokemon being real and you get to punch Onyx in the face. Because <laughs> that would hurt. And also, he's, like, you know, the size of my car. But, you know, he, you want to watch it happen and see it occur and be a part of it without being a part of it, if that makes any sense. Um, so what I've been doing most recently, uh, after filling in most of my historical data, is hanging out at Pokemon Leaves. Uh, if you're not you know, engaged in this uh, actively, just a quick rundown, this is mostly for you, George. Um, the, uh, they're sanctioned groups of recreational players. These are people who have like the OK stamp of the Pokemon Company International to be playing, and they're then rewarded for playing. You earn points over time for participating in tournaments and things uh, to encourage you to come out and be involved in the community. Uh, much like how Satoshi Tajiri designed his game to be played on a mobile platform so that you have to be with people. Uh, I'm getting the Eon ticket right now from, from one of these guys, whoever picks it up from me. Um, you have to be in the room with them to get it though, right? The street pass has to be turned on. The idea tournament points that way, you have to be in the room with people. Uh, all ages are welcome at these things. really shocked me at first to find out that almost everybody is an adult, like well over the age of 18, uh, actively engaged in these games. I was expecting a much more like kid-heavy presence, um, but you know youngsters these days, they don't want to get into the Beatle thing. Um, but it is always kid-friendly. It's a very family-friendly atmosphere everywhere you go. I've been all over, uh, and I'm constantly impressed with how family-friendly it is. Uh, and and uh, the Pokemon company is very careful to keep it that way. 
Uh, the, the card and video games are supported uh, at local, regional, national, and international tournaments. Uh, I've, I've watched, I think, the past three years the, uh, the international tournament being streamed both in English and in Japanese because in Japan it's even shown on, on like, television. Uh, you can tune into the international Pokemon tournament. It's kind of crazy. Uh, although the Twitch feed this year uh, from the American side was also really intense. And now they have color commentators, and uh, you know it's being treated like a professional sporting event, which it really should be, because there are a number of prizes included. There, there's actually money at stake, even in addition to the merchandise and and sort of the credit that you get uh, for winning. You also, uh, if you're younger and you do really well at the national and international level, uh, they'll pay for a little bit of your college, look over your textbooks. Um, so there, there's actually even money in uh, academic scholarships, and plus a lot of social prestige. I mean, uh, the international championships this year were a little crazy in the final round, and man, that guy gets a lot of street cred. I came out smaller than I wanted. Uh, and I absolutely love this picture of the uh, juniors uh, uh, national champion from 2013, I think. Oh, it's the world championship. Oh, that world? That's world, okay. yeah. I have but so yes. many of these photos I get messed up. Yes, it was 2013. Right? It was 2013? Mm -hmm. Okay. So right on that. But I love this photograph, because we've got the president of the Pokemon Company International. And, like, look at that grin. That is a man who loves his job. And and I, I would totally be on board if I got to hand a kid a statue, a Pikachu handing a kid a statue. <laughs> <laughs> that is a meta statue. <laughs> I wonder if he got a statue for designing the statue. Thank you. Anyway. Um, okay, so what I find overwhelmingly in my field work with these with these Pokemon leads, and I've been driving all over Texas, I'm going to head out to California here uh, next month and, and start working there. Um, they're all supported. Incredible. Astonishingly so. You expect in any competitive atmosphere that you're going to get kind of, you know, these mean rivalries a lot of backstabbing in politics because it's a human social system. No, like, they're friends and they're positive. Even, even people who are open about not liking each other at the league will still be supportive and help one another become better at these games. And that just shocks me to no end because it's the only human system I've found so far with that as a primary feature. Um, you go to the tournaments and people still shake hands at the end. I played competitive chess growing up in the U.S. Chess Federation, uh, and we made it to a very high level, my, my school team and I, and we didn't have this level of positivity going on at the tournaments. It was shocking to see this go on at competitive Pokemon uh, groups, and I am just so impressed with it that I felt like I needed to tell the world about it because this is important. Uh, and of course, that brings the question why, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, they tend to identify positively with other players. So it creates this kind of I'm a Pokemon player identity. Uh, and in addition to you know wearing shirts with a joke on it that no one else gets, uh, which I run into a lot on campus, I've been testing it out a little bit. I have some sweet Pokemon shirts and I kind of <laughs> I nudge around to see who gets the joke and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, it creates this interesting identity that we find in a lot of fan-based communities but not necessarily competitive ones. Uh, but when I was analyzing some of my recordings the other day, I, I decided to, uh, to do sort of an analysis of the dialogues themselves, and I started marking every time certain words came up, and I found that the most commonly used terms for most of my interviews with Pokemon players and, uh, and the parents of the children who play were family, community, uh, some variation on friend, some variation on helpful, uh, teach or learn, and fan. So apparently these are the values. So if you've ever seen like a blog where it's got, you know, based on the size of the word, how commonly it's used, um, th these, are, these are sort of those words that come out at these social settings. So it's overwhelmingly positive, uh, very friendly atmosphere. So the educational value of these activities, I think, is pretty obvious. 
uh, fosters uh, cooperation, communication, and problem solving in, in children uh, and adults, actually. I've been, been astonished at the number of people whose math skills have been improving because of their game. Uh, and that goes for the card game and the video game, because the, the sort of calculus necessary for both of those is unique, different, and ridiculously complex. Have you ever broken down your EV points when you're training for competitive play? Wow, that you've got to ease. I, I read an interview with uh, Ray Rizzo the other day, who's a Pokemon champion. That, that guy's brain understands numbers in a way might never work. Anyway, that just leaves me in awe. But otherwise, it's similar to the benefits of chess competition, um, but with sort of this interesting dimension of narrative. Uh, whether you're playing the card game or the video game or you're just a fan. I've met some people who only play casually at these leagues, but they really love the narrative of the game. Uh, there are characters, and the degree to which you choose to personify them uh, or anthropomorphize them uh, can vary, but everyone seems to have sort of an agreement that the narrative is kind of a, a central feature here. We like being able to play with this imaginary world uh, in a variety of ways. I have even run across a young autistic man. Uh, he was 13 at the time, I guess he's 14 now. Um, who has, a, I mean, on the autism spectrum, he's on like a really intense scale of it. So he has trouble communicating with other human beings. He made the first phone call of his life uh, shortly before I interviewed him to call his gaming store and find out if the new cards were in. And the woman who told me this was crying. She was so touched by it. Uh, that, again, astonishing. Like, the impact these communities have. I was expecting a bunch of hobbyists, and this is something totally different. Um, which is why the project has been getting bigger and longer over time. Uh, things that are focused on in the Pokemon narrative, uh, cooperative contention. So, you know, even in the TV show or whatever, uh, they're playing against each other, but then they're also kind of supporting each other. They become better by competing. Uh, and that's a central feature of the league competition, too. Uh, again, inside the narrative, we have what, what uh, Michael Dillon Foster, the anthropologist, calls the encyclopedic mode. People are learning to organize their world as if it were an encyclopedia. Um, and when you organize your, your world in that way inside your brain, you become better at problem solving, uh, uh, at approaching uh, very complex issues because it keeps it organized. Uh, and so taxonomy uh, and general curiosity about the natural world. So it goes back again to Satoshi Tajidi's contention that you can bring that love of nature and curiosity to people through a video game. Uh, and of course, morality, because the, the television show movies in particular are sort of morality now. Um, but so is every other part of this. And we're, so we're wrapping up here. What am I doing as far as interpretation? Because this is anthropology, not science. Um, so deep play is becoming deep multiplay. A uh, very famous anthropologist named Clifford Geertz talked about deep play. Now, what, what do we mean when we say play? Well, it's the primary mode of human learning. Uh, children like to play games because that's how they pick things up. Children who learn math by playing math games pick it up faster, better, and retain it uh, more over time than children who are sort of crammed down their throat through rote memorization. Um, which is why rope doesn't work as well as playing games. Uh, so it's, it's how we learn things, it's how our brains are wired. It's also how we process complex information. Uh, people doodling in class are going to process the information they're hearing better than people who are sitting in stark upright. Uh, it's, it's just a simple fact, there's been a lot of research done on this. You need to play to learn things. Uh, it's a valuable means of building community. We like sports, we like video games, uh, we like playing board games together because they build community. Whether they're cooperative or competitive doesn't really matter. Uh, it dissipates stress. You wind out at the end of the day by playing some kind of game. 
uh, or engaging in like a, a visual novel or movie or something. Uh, and it usually involves some kind of a risk. Um, usually the risk is, I'm going to lose the game. But sometimes the risk can be more impactful in what's called deep play. Deep play is a kind of play in which there are so many risk factors that it is illogical for you to be playing. Now, the classic example from Gears, I'm sorry to beat you over the head with academic stuff, because I know most of you don't care about this, but uh, it's a pretty cool paper. It's called Notes on the Balinese Cockfight, in which he went to Bali in, I say the 60s, the paper's from 73, um, and he observes cockfighting in Bali, where it's a grown man's activity, and they will bet their entire life savings on a single cockfight. That's illogical. It's completely ridiculous. It's like going to Vegas and risking all of your tuition. Um, why on earth would you do it? Well, Geertz tries to sort that out, and so I felt like I was in the same position, hence deep multiplayer. These people are, on some level, even if you're not actually making money at it, there is a sort, sort of a, a, a social prestige and a social capital uh, that you're risking by engaging in these games. And by collectively doing it, as a society, as a community of players, fans, uh, and, and otherwise engaged people, you're sort of taking a social risk of embarrassment, maybe, of losing the game, uh, worrying about other people's perceptions of you, or simply having wasted your time or money or whatever. Uh, there is always some kind of an individual risk going on, and thus, by doing it collectively and bonding through shared risk, I call it deep multiplayer. Um, so it turns out that ultimately, uh, guys like Tensu, what do you do the main like art director on the old old games anyway? Uh, Satoshi Tajidi and the Pokemon Company International, they're kind of telling the truth when they say that you know the stuff's about supporting each other, community, positive engagement. Um, so why does the play have to be violent necessarily? I mean, why do we like Street Fighter more than My Little Pony? Although. My Little Pony Street Fighter is coming in, and it's going to be pretty spooky, I imagine. Uh, one of the elderly uh, Chinese men I interviewed, James Chang down in Houston, uh, he lived in China before, during, and after the Cultural Revolution, so pre-communist, post-communist. Um, and so he's seen a lot of interesting stuff with the change of cricket fighting. What he told me was there was no official class, this is uh, 1940s cricket fighting in rural China, uh, there was no official class for cricket keeping and fighting. I learned that by playing and talking with my friends, I don't know why I use the British spelling there, uh, in the group or listening to conversations among grown ups on the first subject. Uh, uh, we always went to a, a group to buy crickets from the peddlers. There are people who sell crickets for a living, or it used to be, uh, and went with some grown ups that we knew. They were creating a community of cricket fighters. Um, and he got to know his father and his brother and the guys in his neighborhood because they were all engaged in this activity. Um, and so it's about community. It's about education. You learn how numbers work, how the community works, how to go shopping, uh, basic life skills like that, as well as critical thinking and problem solving. He learned through engaging in this activity. The depth of play uh, or risk heightens the ability to learn if you're in danger, if you're fighting the boss at the end of a game or something, your brain is more engaged whether you realize it or not. The greater the risk, the greater the return as an educative measure. measure. Um, shared experience risk helps form bonds. War buddies are notoriously close, right? Uh, but anybody who's suffered through one of my classes can tell you that he or she has gotten to know their classmates quite a bit better. That was a joke. So, Seriously, though, I, I know people, you know, you're in the trenches together, uh, you're going to come out close. Again, it's a, it's a fact of social behavior. Um, the interesting thing about violent play is that it leads to an understanding of the world. Gerard Jones, who's a journalist and a writer, and former comic book writer, actually, uh, in a wonderful book I recommend to everyone called Killing Monsters, said that exploring in a safe and controlled context what is impossible or too dangerous or forbidden for them, that is, children, uh, although I think it goes for everyone, uh, is a crucial tool for accepting the limits of reality. Playing with rage is a valuable way to reduce its power. 
being evil and destructive in imagination is a vital compensation for the wildness that we all have to surrender on our way to being good people. By exploring violent play, we can then avoid actual violence. This is a photograph, again, National Archives. Um, this is a prisoner of war camp in World War II. These are Americans under the, uh, under the view of Nazi officers. The Americans are boxing with gear donated by uh, the Red Cross, and they're doing it recreationally for fun. They loved boxing, and they used it to negotiate their situation inside the prisoner of war camp. So they're waking up every day with Nazis telling them what to do, where to go, and how, you know, what not to eat. Um, and the first thing they wanted to do when they had the chance was box, because that's how they bonded, ridiculed, and solved their problems internally. Are there negatives in my interpretation of, of what's going on? Sure. I mean, there's gambling. People are going to gamble on anything where there's you know, an uncertain outcome. Uh, unfair profiteering, of course, you're going to get ripped off if you're buying things, trading cards, uh, whatever. Counterfeit merchandise. There was famously in 2001 a big raid at a Chicago airport where it was, I want to say, like $200,000 in fake Pokemon merchandise. You're going to have that with any any popular uh, activity. And so pretty much just all the same bad stuff you could find anywhere with people. Um, but that's not really what's unique. What's unique is the community building aspect of all this. So what's my final analysis of the ethnographic and historical work that I have right now? I had to carefully craft this because it's necessary. Proxy fighting games like Pokemon provide the opportunity to cooperate with a controlled setting where violence is channeled through a central medium. Guards have to target with other people, possibly robots, uh, in such a way that supportive communities of practice are constructed, educated, education and certain skills is valued, and humans are able to negotiate social identity without unnecessary <coughs> risk, physical or psychic, to self or others, or in other words. Pokemon and play in general is good for you. Any questions? <coughs> you can put the lights if you want. Dang, I went over by five minutes. Nice. Alright. Uh, any questions, though? Comments, concerns? What did you okay. play back in 99? Uh, at the Indianap Indianapolis tournament. What did you, you play? You mean cards? Or yeah, cards. cards. Oh, uh, oh no, 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 I was oh. in the video game. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> So regarding your comments in the, in the book written in 2004, yes. um, was Pokemon actually on the decline in 2004? Was it like a level decline? As of the end of uh, fiscal year 2003, there was a slight dip in the numbers of purchase, and a lot of that had to do with uh, gold and silver had come out, and they were right at the, in the midst of like that whole thing with the Pokemon Company International and Game Freak fighting with Wizards of the Coast who used to have the distribution rights for the card game. Um, so they were tug of, tug of warring over that, and that caused delays in the release of the cards. And it had been a long time since the Pokemon game had come out. Uh, and so it, when they had written the book, but not yet published it, it was right as Ruby and Sapphire were in it. And so they hadn't seen the sudden surge in popularity that comes out of every new game. So it was really just crappy time. <laughs> it's good to know there's some Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so uh, yeah, actually, I've never asked any of the any of the former participants about that, although I'm totally going to. But most everyone I've talked with has kind of vaguely just referenced having one, possibly two crickets. 
uh, unless they were breeding, in which case they would have a stock of them at home, and then like the one that they used for planting. Mm. That's been my finding so far. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks for coming out, guys, and I'm around if you're too shy. <laughs>